there's a wonderful story, uh, a Gordon Wasson story, where he, he took, a, I think, 12 grams or, anyway, a lot in Oaxaca up on a mountain. And he sang all night long, just this exultant, ecstatic singing. And when he came down to the village the next morning, people said, we didn't know you spoke Mazatecan. You sing beautifully. <laughs> I had an experience which reflects on this, which is uh, in 75 when we first wrote the Mushroom Book and we were really doing it a lot because we had a lot of batch testing to do and that kind of thing. <laughs> I, uh, it, it would get into these uh, poetic dialogues where it would just be spieling off its vision of things. But at the end of each of these um, sentences, it would say, says, says, blah, 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 says. And again, and I thought, you know, strange, strange speech habit. And then I read in Wasson that uh, the word sin occurs at the end of the speech utterances of Maria Sabina's and that it is the Mazatec word for says. So it's just like, you know, the mushroom is uncanny. Drugs, models of what drugs do, will not encompass it. Uh, that's why the extraterrestrial thing is so compelling. And I don't know whether the mushroom is a radio or the extraterrestrial itself. When I said this morning that if you, can, if you understand the DNA as a species, you will take control of your form, I always have the notion that the mushroom has done this. And that's why it touches matter so very lightly. I mean, the mushroom is a very thinly spread mycelial network through a field or a meadow somewhere. The, the carpophore, what we call the mushroom, is a, uh, an appurtenance to the sexual process. As Ralph Abraham said one time, it's for sex thrills and sunbathing. And that's all it's for. The mushroom is perfectly able to propagate itself by uh, vegetatively growing through the soil. But the mushroom, if we believe it is an entity, it lives in its own imagination. It has gotten so rid of a physical form that all it is is a little bit of white stuff in the soil and a raging trip in an unknown dimension, which you can only slice into by allowing it to lo translocate into your nervous system. And then it continues to give off its experience of itself, which is an immersion in pure imagination. You know? For it, the thought is the fact of the matter. It's as though the mushroom were made of pure light. You know, if you think about what it would be like to be made of light, uh, light moves at relativistic speeds, Therefore, if a photon has no perception of time, if a photon could think and thought, I am now going to cross the galaxy, and then did cross the galaxy, the photon's perception of how long that took would be zero. The photon is a particle which in the physics we know has the experience as though it were the imagination. And I think that this inner outer space that we keep talking about that we're headed into is like the inner outer space of the mushroom. These things can be found to be uh, contiguous and somehow two aspects of the same thing, arising out of a misperception having to do with edges that we're very interested in the inside and the outside, the surface of my body and how and the interior of my body. And uh, but these inside-outside distinctions are preposterous, obviously. Infinite space is infinite space, and then we're only quibbling about how it's experienced by whether you send a thought or an instrumentated probe obeying Newtonian ballistics. Have you thought possibly of running a program next to a, a historical, cylindrical one you have there of, say, the advent of tea in English society and the advent of coffee in, say, American society and the relationships that, say, between 
Arab society who get heavy copy blinkers and. Uh, and you mean to people. try and track the yeah. the drug yeah, effect? Yeah. Because yeah. Obviously, obviously every society is bound together by a network of drugs. I, I mentioned the other day that the change that's taken place in the United States with the program to stop people from smoking cigarettes, tobacco being a leveler, right. and the rise in stress after that, and then the whole industry built upon stress. Uh, um, there's obviously a relationship between the drugs used in the society That's right. and of what the society does. Well, we were talking last night. My brother wants to say, and is in fact publicly lectured to this point, that uh, the missing link in the question of how did humanness emerge so quickly you know there was basically a hominoid form a, a human-like form three million years ago but really it's in the last 50,000 years that the human brain size has undergone this immense expansion the human brain has grown more in the last 50,000 years than in the previous three million years and uh, he wants to suggest that the catalyst for that was actually that when when the when Africa turned drier and people started living on the ground and hunting in packs, they encountered herds of ungulate animals and they would track them for days. And this tracking of herds of animals brings you through a lot of their manure naturally. And so they would have noticed this very anomalous object in the world of natural objects, which is the mushroom. It's very large, it's very noticeable, and they would have eaten it. And this would have conferred a sufficient adaptive advantage, the expansion of consciousness, that they would have, uh, it would have been sufficient to prime the pump to develop consciousness. I talked to Roland Fisher years ago about some of these ideas. He did experiments, very interesting experiments at NIMH, in which they could um, impart, they had two parallel metal bars, and they could, by turning a screw, deform one of the bars slightly so they were no longer parallel to each other. And they would take straight people, and people who had given, been given small doses of psilocybin, and they would sit them down in front of this thing, and they would say, push the buzzer when the bars are no longer parallel. And they discovered that people on small doses of psilocybin could pick this up much sooner than normal people. Mm -hmm. And so Rollins conclusion, he said, there, you see, here's perfect proof, scientific proof that taking drugs gives you a truer picture of the world. Well... It's a joke, of course, but if we're talking about hunters looking, hurling spears and trailing after animals, a 5% increase in visual acuity is a staggering adaptive uh, advantage. And that's just one of the most trivial effects of the mushroom, is this improvement of visual acuity. What it does for language is totally unexplored, what it does for memory, what it does for uh, all kinds of things is unexplored. If we, you know, before they were called psychedelics, before they were called all the things, and theogens and all these things, they were simply given a phenomenological description, consciousness expanding drugs. Well, if you take that seriously, consciousness is what it's all about. Consciousness is what we certainly need. It's what we're in short supply of. We are not going to weather the cultural crises that are bearing down on this planet without a great deal of consciousness uh, being generated. So if there is any agent in the environment, drug, teaching, practice, you name it, that actually uh, increases consciousness, it is going to loom very important. In my experience, uh, hallucinogenic drugs are pretty much uh, unique in the power and the efficacy that they bring to the process of promoting consciousness. Yeah, over here, is there something? No? Yeah, go ahead. 
Well, my experience of it is not that it's no sweat. It's the most terrifying thing I do in my life. But I think you ha you have a valid point in that the problem in our society is that we have no shamanic tradition, no schedule of initiation. We don't know whether our kids should take these drugs at fourteen or eight, or and this this is a real problem. I've often you know if in a archaic society. It's all laid out for you. The elders understand. They bring you into it. There's ritual. There's initiation. It's amazing that we're all here, some of the things <laughs> we've been through. I mean, I've made the analogy to a person walking, that a psychedelic drug is like the situation of a person walking along the beach, and they come upon a beautiful sailboat, and they know nothing about sailing. Well, what are the odds that they will be able to enjoy the thrill of sailing if they have no teacher. And I don't mean I'm loath to buy into the notion that one human being has anything to teach another, except things like close your eyes, be quiet, turn off the music. These are teachings of, of great importance. Right. I, I think that there's a part in there too where we've got hold of the wrong end of the stick. I don't think that consciousness can be expanded. I think it's always at its maximum and that, that uh, there are inhibitors around, uh, let's say, habit. Uh, and that uh, these inhibitors can be released by drugs or can be accentuated. Obviously, tobacco is an accentuator. Of, of the inhibitor because it levels it levels things out uh, and there are other drugs which will release the inhibitor so that consciousness seems to be more but it really isn't uh, one is just released the inhibitor does that make any sense well, yeah I mean I want to make sure that you get to see you <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah but you see yeah 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 well now you see yeah now it's random you see. right it's random. Well, the mushroom is such a special case, you know. It certainly draws your attention to an unusual part of reality if it's there all the time. The fact that it seems to be a communicator is puzzling. I still haven't made up my mind about it. When people ask me what, how I choose drugs, I'm, I started out a radical. Nobody else was talking about drugs. Now I find I'm the anchor dragging the ship because I say it should be a plant, number one. It should have a history of shamanic usage, number two. It should have a similarity to brain chemistry. And I am extremely unenthusiastic about MDMA and all these things. It's a plant with a history of shamanic usage. I always say, if you can get two out of the three, <laughs> let's go do it. <laughs> sure. Uh, it's simply that um, at four times the effective dose, it's approaching uh, being toxic. It has, uh, there's this notion which called the LD50 which is how much of a drug you have to give to a ma to 20 mice to kill 10 of them. In other words, 50% of the sample dies, right? The LD50 for MDMA is too close to the effective dose. Absolutely, absolutely. You see, LSD is the safest drug in terms of physical we're always speaking here of pure chemicals, not street stuff, because no one has ever figured out the LD50 of LSD. 
you can take 5,000 times the effective dose, and after 16 hours, you just <laughs> shake your head and walk away from it. Psilocybin, the LD50, is 275 times the effective dose. You have heart failure. You die of, of a, an acute coronary thrombosis. This is not to put down MDMA. Most drugs are toxic. What? Well, anyway, my point is that these shamanic drugs that are hallowed by millennia of usage are much safer. The other thing about them is that they're the strongest psychedelics that exist. This is the great paradox. The safest drugs are the strongest. All it requires is courage, courage which I do not have all the time, and in fact quite rarely for the biggies. And uh, that's very interesting. I've said many times, you know, the problem is not to, with regard to psychedelics, the problem is not to find the answer. The problem is to face the answer. We've got the answer. We don't, Sasha doesn't have to do another thing. We've got the answer. The question now is, do you have the guts to do it? 